Hi, I'm Adam from Amtac Suppressors. Every year we shoot well over 100,000 rounds of ammo between demos and testing, video shoots, things along those lines. And when you shoot that much, something is bound to go wrong sooner or later. So what we're going to do today is share a couple stories with you guys about the times when we have blown up rifles. Now, the first one happened a year ago. We were filming for the video for our SBR series suppressors, and I made a big mistake personally, which led to me fragging a rifle. At the risk of looking like a complete and total idiot, which I definitely will, I promise you, I feel that this is a very good teaching moment. We happen to have the entire thing on video, and we can watch it step by step, see what I did wrong, and hopefully it's something that people can use to not make the same mistake that I did. So what we're going to do is show you guys the video, and then we're going to go back through it again, step by step, see where I've made mistakes, and see the results. So here we go. All right, that was painful to watch. So, we're gonna go back to the beginning here and I'm gonna point out a couple things. The first thing that I want you guys to hear is when the rifle goes click. It's a very distinct click. It doesn't sound like a squib. It's a simple failure to fire. So, common knowledge tells us you get a click, tap, rack, bang, right? So I simply rack out the round and being a little lazy about it because we're just out for a day of filming. And as you can see, the bolt does not go all the way back into battery. Uh, we were about five, 600 rounds into shooting that day, so we had a pretty dirty rifle at that point, and I simply thought I just had a dirty chamber and rounds were just kind of being a little finicky. Unfortunately, what really happened was the round that went click did not have enough neck tension to hold the bullet in place. So when that round chambered, the bullet slid forward, stuck in the lands, and then when I racked out the round, I actually pulled the bullet free from the brass and left the bullet stuck in the barrel. Now I walk back to the start. I'm slingshotting the charging handle of the chamber around. The reason I'm doing this is because this rifle does not have a forward assist. After a few times it goes in a chamber. And while I think I'm chambering around, what's really going on is I'm pressing the bullet that's in the new round back into its own case. As soon as that goes into battery, I was completely hosed. I had no idea that I had two bullets in there. So all it took was for me to pull the trigger and I didn't have a rifle anymore. Now, since I was using a suppressor, I was shooting without ears on that day, and when that thing blew up, believe me, it was extremely loud. I know that some dude's there yelling at his computer screen right now about how I dropped the rifle, and that's not tactical, and I should get back in the fight and all that, but let's face it, I'm just a three-gun shooter. Nobody's shooting back at me here. So I did what my body told me to do, dropped the rifle, and as I predicted, looked like a complete total idiot. And this... That's the look that somebody has when they blow up their top shelf JP rifle. That is not one of our demo guns. That's my personal rifle. So we got back to the shop. Uh, I was pretty sure my rifle was completely toast. I actually had to put it in the vise and I beat the bolt carrier out of my upper with a hammer. If we take a look at the inside of the upper, you can see where the brass is blown apart at the one spot that doesn't have any reinforcement around the bolt, which is of course the extractor. Uh, if we look at the brass separately, you can see the giant hole where the extractor was. And here's the bolt with the corner of the extractor blown off. So we're going to talk about lessons learned here in a second. But first, I want to give a quick shout out to Vortex and JP. This is the rifle that I was shooting that day. And this is the scope that was on it. It's a Vortex Razor HD2 1 to 6. And despite being blown up and then dropped from 5 feet, it didn't even lose zero. The reason I know it didn't lose zero is because despite beating the bolt carrier group out of this thing with a hammer, all I did was put a new bolt in it and it was up and running the next day. In fact, it was still a half minute rifle after doing that. Uh, since then, I have worn out the barrel. This is a proof research carbon barrel that I've put in there and changed out the stock to an XLR Industries, new handguard on here, but the milled upper, lower trigger group, firing pin, even the bolt carrier that was in it that day is still what I'm running in competition. Uh, JP and Vortex build their stuff like tanks. So huge thanks to those guys. This is a great example of getting what you pay for. So when you look at what happened that day, the real problem isn't so much with what I did in the field. It was with my reloading process. Uh, that round didn't have enough neck tension and the bullet was able to get forward and stick in the lands, which led to all of the other problems. So after figuring that out, I sent the video to the guys at JP. They took a look and they concurred that that was most likely the problem. 
I went back through my reloading process. I adjusted my dies, fixed that. Then I took all the rounds that I already had loaded and ran them through that portion of the reloading process again to make sure that those bullets were properly seated with the right amount of crimp and neck tension. Since then, I've shot somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 rifle rounds and I haven't had a problem. So if you are reloading, pay close, close attention to that because it is a problem that can sneak up on you and it's going to bite you sooner or later. Now we're going to share the story about another rifle that we had that did not fare so well as this JP. That rifle, which was attached to that, this didn't happen in the event. We actually cut it apart with a bandsaw. But what happened here was somebody was helping us out at a demo. Uh, they weren't part of our group. They were just somebody who's walking by and kind of chatting with us and helping us load mags. And we were loading up a bunch of 556 five, and they picked up a 300 blackout off the ground, we think, loaded it into the middle of a 556 five, mag, and then handed that mag to his buddy who then ran it through our rifle in full auto. We got about 15 rounds in and kablooey. It was not a pretty sight. Uh, this explosion was drastically more violent than the one that we had with this rifle. Uh, Elmer fudded the upper pretty good. It blew the magazine out of the bottom, belled out the magazine, smashed all of the rounds in a little itty bitty pieces. Uh, the bolt carrier went about halfway back. It blew the bottom off of the bolt carrier. It blew the extractor off of the bolt. It can move about this much, but it's pretty well just kind of stuck in there now. Uh, the way that we confirmed that it was in fact a 300 blackout is when we cut it apart with the table saw, you can look into the back of the action there and you can actually read out on the back of the cartridge. So pretty definitive. Um, for those of you wondering, bullet made it about that far down the barrel. I don't know how much of it's down there, but that's, I don't know, maybe halfway down a 16 inch barrel, right about to the carbine link gas system. Uh, the lesson here is pretty darn obvious. Do not put a 300 blackout round in a 5.56 mag. Be really, really diligent when it comes to handling your ammo, especially when you have those two together. Uh, there are people out there who say that you cannot get a 300 blackout at the chamber in a 5.56, and I can tell them definitively that they are wrong. I've seen it, and man, it's not pretty. Uh, so if you happen to find yourself at an Amtac suppressor's demo and you want to come up and help us and we shut you down, we're not trying to be jerks. It's just because that's kind of bit us before. If you have any questions about either of these incidents, post them up in the comment. And if you have any questions about the suppressors, uh, both of which happen to live through these and are still in our demo fleet today, by the way, then visit us at amtaxsuppressors.com.